Welcome to Bittersweet Queensland, um, the John Oxley Library up late, part of the Memories from a Forgotten People exploration that's happening all across the precinct. Uh, my name's Kate Evans, I'm from Radio National, and we're here tonight in the John Oxley Library with some extraordinary material that you'll have a chance to look at in more detail. So there are images and official records, there's letters and diaries, and significantly there are voices from Australian South Sea Islanders in particular, there are 51 voices from 1906 in a document that I'm sure we'll talk about a bit more, but that you can also go, go and have a look at. And to talk about memory, stories, and the visibility and presence, I guess, of Australian South Sea Islanders, we have here tonight two curators and researchers, Imelda Miller and John Waldron. Now, they have very impressive CVs, and they are, of course, also curators of an exhibition that's here downstairs at the State Library, but they also both have worked across Queensland Museum and GOMA. But I'm hoping that rather than just giving a whole list of your careers, um, that your work and biography sort of emerge as we talk tonight as part of our conversation. So I wonder, Imelda, if you wouldn't mind actually telling us something about your, your personal history your, and your family's um, arrival in, in Queensland. Okay. Um, hi. <laughs> um, my, I'm actually a third generation Australian South Sea Islander. Um, my mother's family is from a little place called Joskalee, just outside of um, Rockhampton. And my father grew up in Mackay. Um, the, we have family connections to Vanuatu and my, uh, just trying to remember, there's so many grandparents, <laughs> my um, uh, mother's family, the Walcombe family, is actually from Ambram, from a village called Wacom Village, which is in the southwest corner of, um, Vanu of Ambram Island in Vanuatu. Um, then there's my father's family. The, uh, my father's mother's side is from the Kaya side. Um, they are from Malakula. Um, the Kaya name doesn't exist anymore because uh, it died with my uncle, who was the only male who had the name Kaya, and he didn't have any children. Um, my Miller side is uh, from this debate that it's from Tanna or the Banks Islands. Um, we're still trying to explore that a little bit more. It's a little bit difficult to explore some of that history because um, some of the names change and the history records aren't really accurate. So um, although something that may seem to be quite an easy task um, is not easy at all um, to search through our records. Um, and also a lot of people have the same name which um, through generations which makes it also difficult to find out more information. So I'm still on a journey of exploring um, who, who and where all my families come from um, and I think that's part of my work and the passion and where it comes from is through that exploration. Well tell us more though about how to trace your story and stories like it. I mean, is there much material in formal institutions like, say, here at the John Oxley Library? Um, there, there's, with my particular experience, um, not so. Uh, a lot of, I find a lot of material in the Queensland State Archives where you can go through births, deaths and marriages. Um, once again, it gets kind of confusing because just in, on my mother's side, there's about for William Parters um, through my um, mother's father's side. So it makes it very difficult to figure out who who uh, William is and which one you're talking about at any particular time. Um, however, through the exhibition Sugar, um, oh, I had an interesting experience where I went to interview um, Sterling Tamara and his mother, Anita Tamara, in Mackay. And during that interview, uh, just before we, actually before we started, um, there was a bit of an exchange of information and um, Nita, we were looking through the images in the sugar exhibition and Nita pointed out um, that one of the people in um, that photos were, was actually, um, I think it was my grandfather or my great-grandfather and I, I've never seen an image of him so I could never really confirm it and unfortunately my father's passed so I can't really get his confirmation of who that person is and um, so 
there are things there, but as um, I suppose people die, the people with those it, that information pass on, um, it, it makes it really difficult to kind of explore those kind of questions, I suppose. Well, don't worry, I'm not going to put you on the spot and make you reveal your, all your family <laughs> secrets. Um, and so we will be talking about the sort of broader history, um, but obviously if you want to personalise it, feel free. Um, but... John, if I can turn to you, I mean, the way that you came to this story was through the sugar industry. So what were you doing? How did you come to, um, you know, be interested? Well, I was, I was fortunate to uh, have the opportunity to, to move to far north Queensland uh, to a place, uh, to manage a place just near Innisfail, which was called the Australian Sugar Industry Museum which is situated in a very small little village at Marillion, just outside of, outside of Innisfail. And it was a, a museum that had a, a real uh, community history uh, in that area and managed to trigger quite substantial funding uh, in one of the big celebrations. I can't quite remember which one it was, but, and, and expanded uh, quite greatly. But it sat as a fairly static uh, facility for quite a while and uh, the board at the time who were quite progressive but they're all they were all mill managers and sugar farmers um, felt uh, that they needed to uh, try and bring some life to that facility so I shifted from what was a regional gallery in Sydney and took on a, a, a heritage facility uh, in far north Queensland but I brought with me I guess a practice of uh, community engagement and involving community in, in storytelling and developing um, projects. So I really, you know, it was obvious that this, to, to, to change that facility into something that was much more vital and meaningful, it needed to really address uh, its, the, the industry's multicultural heritage. And uh, particularly with having that namesake, the Australian Sugar Industry Museum, it needed to be really talking about its history quite um, bluntly and, and bravely. And so I suggested to that board that they needed to um, develop a display um, that uh, really explored the history and the contribution of the South Sea Islander people to the sugar industry. And, uh, and that led to a touring, uh, the notion of a touring exhibition and a, and a wave of grant funding writing and all of that. But along the way, the project snowballed and it, it was clear that to make this um, a valuable and again, a meaningful undertaking that we needed to have someone who could uh, go into community and consult and, and promote the, the activity. And it was that stage that I was fortunate to meet Imelda who was working at Queensland Museum. And uh, so that sort of started us on a path of um, this exploration of this, this heritage. And, uh, and, uh, and, you know, I'm so pleased that I've had a, a second opportunity to work with Imelda um, and to develop an exhibition. But that exhibition was called Refined White. And it was, uh, it was really, uh, it did deal with, uh, or it presented quite a lot of historical photographs from the John Oxley Library. We were showing um, objects from the Queensland Museum, uh, but we also um, commissioned a photographer to take um, a series of photographs up and down um, the Queensland coast because we wanted to show just how this community was was vital and existed today. You know, so it was uh, it was very much about. This is the community today, and uh, there's a few faces here even uh, who, uh, who were photographed and in that exhibition. And it's uh, wonderful to be able to connect with the community again in this occasion. But uh, we set out to uh, send that exhibition into all of the major populations along the, the east coast and right down into to, um, McLean in, in northern New South Wales. So all the prominent sugar locations, um, museums, into beautiful little museum in Josca Lee. Uh, it re the exhibition reconfigured in all sorts of ways and proud to say it finished at the National Museum uh, on the 10th year anniversary of, uh, of recognition to uh, commemorate that. So uh, that was our first opportunity and, and it was uh, my first, I guess, um, experience. I really had little knowledge before going to that facility of this history and uh, 
Um, however, coming from, you know, being a northern New South Wales boy, I was around the sugar industry a bit, but uh, certainly didn't appreciate just uh, the significance of this contribution and uh, how, how hidden this heritage was. Well, there's a, there's a lot to that story, and, and I know that you, you're both concerned with showing continuity and, the, and the, the presence of South Sea Islanders as well. But given that we're sitting here with a whole lot of fantastic archival material from the John Oxley, I wouldn't mind staying in the 19th century for a bit. So what was going on 150 years ago in the sugar industry and the debates about labour and who could do what in Queensland that, that's meant, um, you know, indentured labour was, was what people were looking to? Well, I guess it was all about development, you know, that the, the mad keen to, to develop and expand economy and, and, and grow business and uh, uh, there were lots of uh, influences uh, with changes overseas in regards to the slave trade and, and the cotton plantations and I guess there, there was an opportunity here to, uh, it was perceived an opportunity to, to, to develop cotton and to try and fill a void that was happening internationally and uh, so um, a cotton plantation was proposed proposed for Bodesen and uh, and had a short existence, um, I, I imagine, because it was so damn difficult to grow cotton there. But there's still remnants uh, in that area of, of drainage um, that was that was dug by uh, South Sea Islander people that were brought there, and and you know just the and clearing of the land and and, and so forth. So it's uh, there was lots of hardship experienced at that very early stage. Um, but there were pressures around um, being able to develop these industries but also do it in a very uh, cheap way. You know, so finding a cheap labour force, which just happened to be, seemed to be across the waters, um, was, was quite attractive to some. So Imelda, how do you see this story then, as if we look at it in terms of um, economics and, and trade, is it a trade in sugar and cotton or a trade in bodies? I think it's about people, um, you know, I think it's about uh, lives and I think it's um, about community here and a community in the islands and um, and I think it had different impacts um, in both places. Um, it's hard, it's, um, I'm just trying to think, tr articulate what I'm trying to say, but um, it, ultimately, it's about people's lives, and I think it's it's an economical one. But then it's also about how how do you treat people um, in that kind of context of a labour force, and um, and and what happens to them afterwards. I mean, uh, and I think that a lot of those words um, that we talk about with this history, such as black burning and slavery and cheap labour and all those kind of things, ha have different meanings to different people and um, in different contexts of time. I mean, something that may have just seemed like sh um, a cheap labour force back then could be classified and is basically classified as slavery today. I mean, um, so there, and I think there's a lot of um, emotion within this history too. And I think it's not just about what, um, the economical thing, but it's about what happens um, emotionally and physically to people in different places. One of the things that really struck me looking at some of the original material though, was how contested that, that labour trade was in the 19th century as well. So up on the tables there, there are various reports, particularly going between the Queensland government and the Home Office in the UK, with people objecting to the trade, particularly among um, missionaries and some of the anti-slavery societies, saying this is appalling. And so there are a whole lot of documents there with people doing investigations. Um, and then sometimes coming back and saying, no, no, it's all fine. But a number of them, even those who were real apologists, said it's better now, it's not as bad as it was before 1885. So even they were acknowledged there was some pretty bad stuff happening before 1885. I mean, were you um, surprised by the, the level to which it was, it was already controversial, even in the 19th century? Um... 
I, I don't think so because I th I'd like to think and hope that there is good um, in any community, um, no matter how bad things seem at the time. I think, um, you know, maybe it's the islander in me, but I always, always live in hope that, you know, there is good in people. Um, I, and unfortunately, it's very small bad things that can overshadow the lot of good that other people do. Um, but I think it is what it is and, um, you know, and I don't think there's anything that can change how people feel about that. Um, but, you know, I think the debate was then and the debate still goes on now, so it's, cover it's continued over time and, um, and I think it will continue through time. But I think collections like this enable people um, to make up their own minds. I mean, to have a look at the literature and see who was writing what at the time and um, to make their own minds up about what was going on. And, of course, the other thing that was going on is that um, Australia was moving towards federation. And something that I've said before in these sessions is that every single time we have a John Oxley Library up late about any area of, of Queensland history, it ends up being some sort of fight between Queensland and the federal government. And um, it's a fine, long tradition. And it was certainly happening around labour trade as the as federation was happening and they really didn't want to have non-white labour in the state. It was became the central debate, I think, for the white Australia policy. Um, so I'm guessing that's why you called your first exhibition together Refined White. Yes, it was. That's right. Was yes. there any resistance? I mean, it's a great title. <laughs> um, I can't recollect that there was resistance. Uh, you know, I, I think we expected that to be some, but uh, we, we certainly wanted to express um, how important um, this was to to the shaping or the the progress of the white Australia policy. You know, and it, it was almost again uh, a sort of a hidden fact that. Um, that the, uh, the South Sea Islander story was to contributed greatly uh, and influenced the, the happenings of the time. But um, so it was an important title and, and it does sit provocatively, I guess, uh, and I'd hope um, it, it caused people to question, you know, why and, uh, and hopefully to understand why. But uh, I think the, the important thing now in having you know, such fine collections. Um, um, today we, we fully appreciate the, the um, importance of oral history and, and, and the stories from community as, as being as important as the, the written history. And, and we, we are able to, um, in Refine White, I think we started to explore that a bit in, in the voice of um, South Sea Islanders. Um, and I feel that we've done that further now. But, um, you know, that's, there are so many layers, as Imelda said, to this history. And, uh, and uh, there is, you know, they're all, they're all correct. There were, they were all, there was some very it's poor parts of our, our history as a result of um, the, the slave labour trade. You know, it's, um, but, you know, we need to acknowledge uh, all of that and and I guess our role as curators is to present that as fully as possible and let people uh, be aware and uh, to go away um, with a better knowledge and uh, and to be making up their own minds around the story as well. And Imelda, I know in the 1890s, for example, there's a whole lot of cartoons from um, publications like The Bulletin that were particularly nasty and as you're involved in um, connecting this history to communities, how do you negotiate the, the really tough, really painful stuff, saying, look, look at this, I want you to confront this or not? Did you have to make decisions about, you know, some of that really difficult documentation or confronting imagery and what you're going to do with it? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm, Kate, I'm, I was pretty young when, well, you know, I was younger, I keep saying that, but <laughs> I, I, I was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, was, I was pretty new to the cu curating um, 
thing when I first come into contact with John and um, you know I take my hat off to John because he, he actually employed me without knowing me <laughs> and um, but you know we had many discussions and and things like um, you know we talked to you know we talked about history and the oral history and how do we combine them and we talked about the cartoons and how you know I, I was a bit reserved about oh I don't know how the community are going to cope with this and so it was a really big learning curve for me and, and a journey because it was about me probably confronting some of my fears about our history and how I interpret um, uh, different documents and different language. Um, I remember having a conversation with John about the oral history thing and we debated about, you know, uh, text and I, you know, I said to John, well, why is somebody's written history more important than my oral history, you know? I've heard this from my grandparents and they've heard that from their parents and uh, why should I have to undervalue um, that um, within, uh, you know, this society today? And so... Um, John took that on board. I don't know whether he was scared of me being an islander or I have relations, I don't know. <laughs> relations. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it's that's that, I mean, that conversation, you know, the touring and throwing about the good and the bad and the pros and the cons and trying to work out what is the balance. Um, you know, that, that actually gets the message across, I think. And um, I do remember looking at those cartoons and I, I found them very powerful and, uh, and I did find them confronting because I don't know whether I wanted to see the bad in community, you know, in the history. I, I, I was exploring that and um, I, I didn't want to think that people really didn't want us here. I suppose, and that, that was really hard for a young person learning about his, their history um, and family history to think that a community didn't want us here and um, that they would want to say these things and then to convey that in a cartoon. Uh, you know, I just had so many mixed feelings about it and I thought if I have mixed feelings, you know, what's everybody else? Because I think I'm quite liberated at times. <laughs> but I just... I didn't know how to approach it, but I thought it had to be told, and um, and it wasn't. And I soon learned over time that, you know, it's not my job to make up other people's minds. It's really about presenting everything as fact, and presenting different sides to the story. That it's not just one side, and that I lead the viewer or the community to make up their own minds about. Um, what they're looking at. But, you know, it's about the tough calls and it's about being responsible too for those tough calls. But just think, staying on the visual stuff though, mm -hmm. how important is the visual material? I mean, there's an awful lot um, of photographs and in a whole range of different contexts. So some of them have been made as picturesque postcards where the Pacific Island labourers are part of a picturesque image of Queensland. And then there's others um, over there that are from family collections. There are others that are formal ones. And just before we came here, I was telling these guys about a very, very odd photo album that you can have a look at over there. Um, it's one of the many laid out. And I was looking through it today and there were photos of um, labourers in the cane fields and then I turned over another couple of pages and there was a, it was a late 19th century reenactment of um, an Aboriginal massacre. And they did it in this terribly light-hearted way across two pages. They had a picture called a Nuke Chum First Encounter and he's sitting in, outside a tent with two Aboriginal people pointing their spears at him. And the next one is called Retribution. And again, it's a staged photo of people going... <gasps> and he's shooting the two Aboriginal men. And this is in a, um, a family album that's all done with very, you know, large format, nice quality photos that's there as part of their family entertainment. So these photos are really powerful and really interesting and occasionally they rock you back on your heels and go, oh, this is very strange. So how important are the photographs for the work that you both do? Oh, they're vital, of course, and and uh, and the exciting thing is that the the collecting continues here, and uh, that we're starting to see some more contemporary imagery come into the collection. Um, it's not to say that there's there's not some big gaps as well, but you know those um, you express so much through those photographs, and you juxt juxtapose the photographs that were 
perhaps snapped out on the plantations against the studio shots and you know um, you it's not too hard to to really interrogate those and and to and to tell your story through uh, those two different types of photographs but um, something I found through refined white was the there are not many photographs where you see people smiling in in these and but those that you do uh, as I said that are rare they are of people together within community within family and it just shows how strong that bond and that community was to to stay to survive you know but when they're out working and the work is so hard you can you can read that in their faces and it's um, it's quite easy as curators to to express that through these photographs these studio shots uh, some of them are just bizarre um, but again, there is lot, a lot that you can read into those studio shots about wealth and um, about, you know, I guess respect and, um, and various uh, statuses and, and so forth within, within culture. But it's, um, you know, the, for me, we, in Refine White we used, uh, we lent on the photographic material and the, and the, the bulletin cartoons uh, I was going to say that we we had the most trouble with the bulletin cartoons. I think in the end we showed maybe only three or four, but we also decided to print them in the education resource, which is you'll see here as well. So that that resource was for school students. It was geared ex precisely for teachers to be able to utilise it. And uh, Michael Berry, who was a, a researcher writer, uh, wrote that that publication. He really uh, dedicated quite a bit. Um, of interrogation to those cartoons and uh, and uh, and took the students um, through a full investigation of of their purpose and uh, their impact and uh, so that you know that translated in, in the same way for the exhibition it was very important to show them um, but uh, the you know the visual is critical but we we're also quite keen to have the voice come through as much as possible so uh, yeah well there are so many voices in this um in this story and i'd like to go back to what you said about not wanting to think about a whole community wanting to get rid of south sea islanders because of course that's what was happening in the 1890s and then the lead up to 1901 and one of the shocking things for me reading the first year of Commonwealth Hansard in 1901 is that there are three bills that um, are entwined through the whole year. So there's the Immigration Restriction Bill, which is the one we traditionally think of as forming the White Australia policy. There's the Tariff, which they talk about for a whole year. And then there's the Pacific Island Labourers Bill, which is all about trying to legislate to get rid of the, the people who were here. And of course it happened. And, and so many people were deported. And one of the things that sort of struck me in this year as we're talking about the 150th anniversary is that not only is it a story that isn't well enough known nationally and should be part of the you know, national curriculum and so on, but that the discussions have been about blackbirding and they've been about the arrival in Australia. I've heard a lot less about the return about what happened in 1906-1907. Um, why is that? Is it a hard story to tell? I, th I think yeah. I, well, I, I think it is. Um, there, there's a. Can you remind us what what happened? So oh, I'm trying to think of the figures. <laughs> yeah, we don't need numbers. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, the White Australia policy come back and islanders were deported and some stayed. And those who remain here are the, called the descendants, which are the Australian South Sea Islanders. Um, and I am one. Um, but others were deported back to their islands. Um, but so it, there's many stories about people not being returned to the correct island, um, to being dropped off. Um, some never made it back. Um, and, and, you know, there was difficulties because people may have married, intermarried into different islands and therefore that wasn't acceptable once they went back. Um, and 
you know, so there was, and there's people who had families and the families remained, some remained here while others went. Um, you know, there's, there's a story, I think Rowena Trevi told the other day about someone returning to the islands and then being, and then the mother being left here with two children to raise. And so I think that's a whole story on its own because it's so complex and I think there's a lot of pain um, within that history. Um, and I think there's a lot of that pain which is carried within generations to date, so it's a living pain. And I think that to do it justice, I think it is a whole topic on its own. And in the session downstairs when we were um, having the curators tour, um, somebody asked about the the criterion for who got to stay and who, who didn't and who got deported. Um, a document that is absolutely fascinating that's over there on the, the tables is the um, Royal Commission by the sugar industry in 1906. And it's trying to work out how Queensland would still have an industry when it lost these labourers. But it also... Um, uh, it, it interviews people. So it's interviewing people who owned cane fields, it's interviewing overseers, policemen, and 51, this is a rough count, this was just me going through and trying to count them up, but around 50 Pacific Islanders were um, gave their sort of life story and talked about how long they'd been here, um, what work they did, whether, whether or not they wanted to return. So how important is that document? Because you've got names, you've got where people were working, where they were from. Is that an important tool for family history? Oh, definitely. Any place you get a name and a place mentioned, it is the, the, the information is so lacking in our history, it's not funny. And um, anywhere you can get something like that named is, is fantastic. Um, because not only do um, just having the name, but name changes over time. Um, that that makes it really difficult to trace back. So when you get these original documents that name people at a particular place at a particular time, sometimes at a particular age, it actually um, then helps you to start putting um, the pieces together. Um, but these these pieces of information are just so rare. And um, like you said, I mean, it covered how many people and there was something, I mean, about 50,000 contracts or 62,000 contracts issued over the time period. And you're talking about 51 people mm. mentioned in, I mean, every little bit counts, don't get me wrong. But, um, you know, when you're talking about those kind of numbers, it's just like, well, what if, you know, to find the rest, I suppose it's a journey and and you know maybe there's other people out there you know farmers and descendants of farmers or government agents and I've come across a couple and you know I've, I've had a man chase me down who's a far his grandfather was a farmer who had a property and um, he gave me a list of the islanders names and drew me a map of where they all lived on his grandfather's property and so that's another little bit of information to be shared um, out there. And the story of burials, the story of what happened when labourers died on properties, that's becoming more and more, um, getting a lot of attention. That seems to be a really important part of the story too. Yeah, I think, um, I think any, you know, it, it's that, you know, these are people. I think that's what it all comes back to. And to be, you know, nameless and not even have a place to, for someone to refer to you. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's really sad, and I think, uh, um, you know, I think it's really important. I mean, there's stories about people dying in the cane fields and just being buried where they drop, you know, and it's kind of like... And, and then people just continue working, and I just... I think there's a lot of emotion attached to that. That I mean, I keep talking about emotion because I think some of that emotion and that pain is what stops our community from talking. Um, and I, I think sometimes there's a learnt kind of behaviour that we've inherited from this painful past. But um, I think, uh, you know, death is very much been a part of our community. It's, it's one of the biggest occasions that we gather together, unfortunately, um, today. But um, I think 
you know, when we show pictures of the cemeteries and some of the places where people have been buried, I think um, it's really important to remember that memory and to keep reviving that memory as time goes on so the next generation doesn't forget. How much then is this a, an, an international or transnational history? I mean, because I'm wondering what happened to the, the people who returned and, and how, just how complicated that that history becomes, I guess, because it's, particularly if they weren't even returned to the island they'd come from, but I imagine they might have been here for, what, 15 years, 10 years, 18 years, three years? It was a whole combination, wasn't it? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, some longer, but I think it gets, it's very complex, you know. Uh, Not only do you have family here, but there's a family back in the island somewhere who are waiting for somebody to return. Um, they leave markers for families, you know, grow trees and, um, and they, they wait for us to go back. And so, um, and, you know, there's that whole economic issue of people being taken away and um, the uh, population decreasing in the islands and the men were all here and they didn't have men there. So there's a lot of different issues, I think, around that. It, it is a, you know... It's a, it's a global issue, um, what we're talking about. And I think it continues on today. And I mean, um, we may have, in a way, be um, very, you know, lucky to have been here. We we now, um, you know, live in nice houses, but we have families that, um, and some of us have been back to continue that connection to the families and the islands. And I think that's really important that those linkages continue. And um, but then when you get back, you know, to make sure you're talking to the right people. I mean, there's a lovely person called Sonia Minicon. Uh, she has a business called um, Blackbird. And they work to reconnect people here in Australia with families back home in the islands. So I think, um, you know, it does get quite complex and quite emotional too to actually be able to go back, to, to be able to get the information to go back to those ancestral homes. But, and it also is quite, well, it's overtly political at times too, isn't it? I mean, I think the, um, well, there was an, an MP speaking here um, on the weekend, but I think also a, um, a connection with the, the Solomons that, um, and I think you were telling me, John, the other day, was also explicitly about making connections to sorry times and to the really difficult histories between the islands and Queensland. Can you talk about that? Well, uh, you know, the it is a, a very emotive um, part of the history and that it sort of connects um, or has relevance right back to an earlier early time where um, um, the treatment uh, of Indigenous Australians um, um, was, was particularly poor and uh, in some places... Um, you know, worse than the Australian South, the, the sorry, the South Sea Islander treatment. Um, but uh, as was experienced at Bundaberg last year, the the, the chiefs from Vanuatu and um, and other islands, I believe, came and um, spent quite a bit of sorry. You know, th- there was sorry time around um, around that those happenings, and so the the people of the islands are very aware of of those stories and um, are very sad and sorry for them. And so we're seeing, not only last year, but it's, as is happening this year, quite a bit of uh, sorry time happening. And, and that's obviously very important for, um, for the communities. Um, but it's making <coughs> us more broadly aware of just how close... Um, close these communities are, you know, the connections between Australian South Sea Islanders and, and, the, and their island homes is, is very strong and there's a, there's a longing there that remains and, uh, and I guess that's, we're seeing that particularly addressed through some of the, the artists that are, are now emerging, you know, that ex- exploration of identity and, and connections is coming through as the most sort of pertinent exploration and uh, you know and that's you know it's there are very difficult stories to you know that are being dealt with and but they're being dealt with through community and through traditional ways which which is how it should be. Um, 
I know that people will have questions or comments that they want to bring um, as well. But I'm just wondering, before we do that, if just thinking of the, the sort of history and the repository of knowledges and stories, what's missing or what would you like to see? I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff there from the John Oxley. I know there's material in the state archives, there's material in the national archives. Are there other stories or collections um, that you'd like to see done that you think need to be done or that need to be connected in some way? Um, I, I certainly like to see um, a more recent past collected. Um, I think Refined Wide is an example of that. I mean, you know, other than the historical images from the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, refined white gilbers, um, images that you can see down in the exhibition are the next lot of images. So there's a huge gap, <coughs> like, between 1910 and... Um, you know, 1980s, 1990s of images and I, I think it would be lovely to fill that gap maybe with a more holistic story about um, Islander, about South Sea Islanders being, working and living in the landscape and interacting with other communities and, and exploring those other stories because you do hear other wonderful stories about South Sea Islanders, you know, mixing with Europeans and the railway and, uh, and all those kind of things. But it's, real, it's not very visible. Um, and, you know, I work in the museum, so I work with objects and I think... Um, looking, you know, for me, especially for over the next six months, is about looking for those objects and represent things that represent us today, you know, in our communities today, in this 150th year, and what can we leave behind or leave here now for, um, you know, in 50 years' time when there's the 200th anniversary? What, what are those things that tell a story about who we are today? And I think um, those would be some lovely things to fill our collections with. Yeah, I think the you know the this commemorative year is was very much a, there was going to be a lot of energy and it's exciting to see that there's been so much activity. But uh, we've talked also about legacy activity and we certainly hope and and expect that there'll be a whole range of um, oral history activity and collecting and community in interrogating and 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 bringing in material into collections. You know, so the the precinct here and, and the state archives and, and others uh, who have energetically um, embraced um, or opened their collections and, and brought community in is really, you know, that's that will hopefully see this, this void which is almost from deportation into probably the, the 80s, you know, there's very little material. It would be great to see that come from the community and it would have to come from the community. But um, we've also, I mean, there was an indication with the, the projects that were done for this exhibition, uh, the Australian South Sea Islanders, because the, the projection, if you saw, if you were here on Friday night, there was a very large scale projection on the buildings of uh, the State Library, and James Muller, projection artist, uh, utilised the John Oxley collection and and other contemporary collections and put them together. But we, we put a call out at a fairly late time, but we did put a call out to the community to receive contemporary images. We wanted uh, to have these beautiful, strong black and white images projected, but to have wonderful snapshots in colour of uh, the community today. Again, just to show the faces of people today, again, to reinforce that this is a, a vibrant uh, community that that has an ongoing uh, heritage and contribution in, in this country. And uh, that didn't quite hit the mark, but there's a lot of potential there with a longer lead time for those sorts of things to happen. And, and uh, you know, there's real indications that the community is very keen to, to get involved with that, which is needed and, and wonderful. Well, perhaps we can hear more about those... Um private family, uh, you know, photo albums and whether or not you, you're willing to show them to the world. Um, and if you don't mind waiting for the microphone before you say anything, just because um, this is being recorded and it will be on the State Library website. But does anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to, to make? Yeah. Uh, how badly were these people treated? Uh, were they fed well and given bedding and all that, or were they, you know, treated really badly like an animal or something? 
Um, well, they they were given rations, but you know, um, compared to the way in which they lived on the islands, and the food that they were given here, um, it it wasn't. What was acceptable here, as far as um, government side of things, they thought it was a substantial diet. However, as far as an islander diet, it wasn't very substantial. Um, I must say that the conditions varied from farmer to farmer. I, I wouldn't like to clump everybody in together, but the conditions were harsh. They, they left early in the morning, they worked hard all day, they got very little food, um, they come home at night, um, and, you know, they were away from their families. Um, it was a new world. They had languages. You've got islanders from 80 different islands all together. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's hectic, you know. Um, and it's, you know, trying to find, you know, the Slama from Vanuatu comes out of the trade of islanders here. And so you've got all these people speaking different languages with different cultural needs all, all in together. So it's quite complex and, um, and you hear horrific stories. Um, some, you hear stories about people being shackled um, as punishment and things like that. Um, but then you hear other stories about farmers you know, um, people saying, you know, they, some farmers treating Ireland as well. So what that means at that particular time, you'd have to look at the whole context of what's going mm. on. And, and you hear about farmers protecting Islanders, you know, at the time of deportation also. So, you know, there are good stories and there are bad stories. Yeah, it's Im really important to note that the, the stories did vary, you know, and, and without interrogating this aspect greatly, but... Um, there seems to be, you know, if a plantation uh, growing cane in a place like Rockhampton, where it was always going to be very difficult, the stories can be quite tough and, and tragic. But in a place um, even around Budrum, where it was much more lush, the stories are, are, are more positive, you know. So it, uh, there is a variation in that. But um, there are photographs here of um, men on horses with guns overseeing workers, you know. So it's and just again, in a sort of quite conventional historical sense, there are three diaries laid out there on the on the table um, from pastoralists, and one in particular that um, that Catherine Cotter, one of the librarians here at the State Library who knows the connection really well and can talk about it more, pointed out: this man's diaries are over a number of years, and he doesn't actually talk very much about his labourers the first couple of years and then he has a huge economic crisis, starts to go bankrupt and suddenly what's going to happen to these labourers, um, you know, what he's going to do, how he's going to survive means that there's a lot more detail suddenly in these very battered let's diary that's over there on the table. So for 1871 he's talking about the people who work for him. Before that they were just sort of part of the landscape that was supporting him and it's not explicit. Um, and so I just had a quick look through three different ones and, and again, there's so much going on and it is immensely complicated but it's such an interesting, such an interesting part of our history, I think. Did the Islanders work as far south as northern New South Wales? Uh, yes, yeah, they did. So uh, into, um, you know, right down to Grafton um, but there is, there is evidence of, of them working down into there as well. Um, like, uh, there's an interesting uh, angle to the the border uh, at the time of deportation. I think there was quite a movement to New South Wales because it was that was a friendlier state than Queensland. And uh, I think there are people here that can <laughs> tell more about that. But um, you talk, Imelda, about that being a don't cross the border type of. You know, there was a story around. Yeah, um, I've, I've been told a story about. Um, people literally, like parents saying to them, whatever you do, don't go near that fence because it means that they've crossed the border and there's a whole heap of different rules that apply to them over there, you know. So, and it's, I think it was literally a barbed wire fence and, you know, um, it's, you know, and we, I had envisaged, you know, having a barbed wire fence for the exhibition and literally the exhibition being called, whatever you do, don't go to the other side of that fence. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> Hi, could you say a little bit more about how people were able to resist deportation, the different ways they were able to do that? Okay. 
I have to dig in my memory now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, there were three different conditions that people could stay. There was time expired people. So there were people who had been here before, I can't remember the year, but it was like 18... I don't know if Alton can help me with you. 20 years. 20, for 20 years, yep. And then there were... Um, I'm trying to think. You might have to help me, Alton, because... Yeah, there was the time expired, and then there was also the marriage. That's right. People who married into the community here, either, oh, sorry, either Aboriginal or European, and, and they did marry a lot of Europeans. Um, and there was the employment aspect at deportation. If uh, you were employed at the time, you were safe. If you were unemployed at the time, either you're married or not, you weren't safe. But then there was the other lot who escaped into the bush. Was, yeah, well, so, so there was informal resistance. Informal resistance, helped by itinerant farmers. Uh, they worked at night to maintain the, the farm's jobs and also hid in the bush for up to a period of 10 years till the, the actual heat of the thing had died down from 1907 through to the war. And so it was still going on those periods. And I know a few people from the audience were there too, but yesterday there was an event at Parliament House, a state reception for Australian South Sea Islanders recognising the 150th and I suppose I was just interested in what that event meant to people who were there, to you Imelda, <laughs> to John, like, um, you know, it was very grand, the Governor was there and the, um, who else, uh, the Premier and the, men the opposition leader and, you know, so, yeah, but just what feelings there were about that event. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I as a, sorry, I'm you, you I'll, I'll jump in. No, as uh, as uh, you know, an outsider, um, it was very. Um, it was obviously a very significant occasion, and uh, it, that significance was felt through the room and. Um, and we were told how significant it was a couple of times too by <laughs> politicians. But um, <laughs> um, but I'd have to say that a few of them, I won't name the names, but uh, delivered very emotive and uh, thoughtful um, speeches. And and uh, and obviously this whole um, commemoration and the acknowledgement um, has has touched them, and that that is pleasing to see. Um, there was also a wonderful speech by uh, Janet Morgan from Mackay who um, graciously delivered um, some clear requests to government and and uh, I guess put put the pressure back on um, the fact that you know this year is a lot of there's a lot of energy uh, and it is a, a special year um, it's uh, not a celebration of them necessarily coming here 150 years it's a celebration of their survival um, and and the work that is necessary to continue um, to acknowledge and, and support this community is is so very important it is still a disadvantaged community uh, in health and education and, and opportunity and it's that has to be recognized and there was an indication that that is recognized but uh, governments have, produced statements and acknowledgements in the past and for whatever sad reason the energy following those has just fallen flat so let's hope that doesn't happen again yeah um i think that there's a yeah i agree with a lot of what john has said <laughs> just to get me out of trouble <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I feel passionate that, you know, I'm, I'm glad that the uh, elders in the community that were there to see the 150th year and that they were recognised for their efforts. And I think Jeanette, she offered the government a few good suggestions. Um, you know, and I think, you know, it, every little step counts, you know, when you're a South Sea Islander. <laughs> and, um, you know, a big part of this year is about creating awareness about our culture and our history 
um, you know, and it's the first step, you know, to going to actually, you know, uh, you know, you know, asking government to not carry us, but to help us, you know. There's real issues in our community that to do with health and housing and education. And, you know, how can people even help us if they don't even know who we are? You know, getting things into the curriculum, getting people educated about who we are um, and, you know, about our history, you know, getting that acknowledgement. That's it, Ultimately, that's what it's all about. Um, and I think, you know, going there and... It's another generation, and you know, uh, you know, uh, sadly to say, in another ten years, um, some of the, those people won't be here. So I think, you know, it, it's another memorable occasion, like it was in two thousand when the Queensland government recognised us as a unique cultural group, um, to be recognised. I mean, what an achievement to grow. You know, I grew up in a time when, you know, my parents told me, "Oh, you're a South Sea Island," and I thought. Where was that? I told a story the other day about, you know, learning about the New Hebrides from a tea towel and at a time when I still thought the world was flat and thinking, what, what, what is this place? I don't, I don't understand. But, um, you know, I, I don't want the next generation or any other generation after me to go through um, their education without knowing who they are and where they come from and being proud of that. So I think that's what it's all about for me. Mm. But Louise, um, that was an important event, um, but I think one of the most important events will happen this next weekend at Bow Desert, where, um, because the work that has been happening at Bow Desert to um, not only um, build awareness for that heritage that was almost forgotten uh, with the cotton plantation and that first uh, arrival uh, there of labourers. Um, but the work that's happened um, with traditional owners and, and with landowners uh, and descendants of um, and with Australian South Sea Islanders is just uh, extraordinary. There has been a, an amazing process of consultation and, and gathering and, and healing. Um, and that will result in a, a community day, a, a walk and a community gathering that is about community. It's not about politicians or anyone. It's just about uh, the community and that history. And that is very important. And uh, so, yeah, there have been many wonderful events. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's great to see that there's a real mix in all of that. And I think there might be one more, one more comment. Yes, here. thank you. I was really interested in your comments about what enabled people to survive during those very difficult years. Um, my husband and I have been involved in doing a lot of research as part of give, presenting an ex work for an exhibition and also music at the Bow Desert event that's coming up very soon, the next couple of days, and. Um, because of my husband's family background where his great-grandfather was a missionary on the, in the New Hebrides who was a fierce opponent of the, of the labour trafficking. Um, we've had a cause to read a lot about um, not just what happened on that end of things but also trying to see, well, if the church was active on the island, you know, what were they doing for people who were working in the cane fields and the cotton plantations here. And we realised not very much <laughs> until um, about the 1870s. And I was in, amazed by the work of one young white woman, Florence Young, who started seven um, schools and missions in different plantations. And then my husband's great-grandfather urged the Presbyterian Church to start a mission at Mackay, um, a mission there. And I just feel this... You know, there may be other factors as well that were part of this amazing capacity to survive that could be documented. Um, so I'd love to hear any comments about that. And then a question. Um, we heard um, a couple of weeks ago that the Prime Minister of Vanuatu has asked the Australian Government for an apology. Um, I'm just wondering how the South Sea Islander people see themselves, you know, and supporting that in some way. Oh, on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I might start with the survival part first, shall I? <laughs> um, look, uh, I think, 
There's one thing I feel very proud about is that I think the uh, Australian South Sea Islander community and the South Sea Island, our ancestors were proactive in our survival. And, you know, um, I know that sometimes when you talk about this history, you know, sometimes it does sound like we're the victim, but it, we were actually quite proactive and I suppose a story close to home and um, anyone who would like to expand on this story... But, uh, you know, there is a story about a South Sea Islander who donated um, uh, some land to the education department to build a school so South Sea Islander kids could get an education um, because they were experiencing too much racism at a local school. And um, so, you know, there's lots of stories and I, I like, like that, that you do here. And um, so, you know, they were very proactive and very adamant that we should have a better life and that we should get an education and, and improve on our circumstances. Um, to the uh, notion of an apology, um, I think, you know, there's a lot of different opinions about um, an apology. Um, I, I know there's supporters of an apology. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't like to actually talk on behalf of the community at this time because I haven't really talked to enough people about, um, about that issue. And I'm always conscious in my work that I am representing and that, you know, it is important for me to gather other views about what is going on. And so, and because... I am in a position within just government and within the museum, which is an institution that relies on fact. I'm very conscious that what I might say might be considered um, to be speaking on behalf of everyone. So, yeah, if I could leave you with that thought. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to be moving on to the uh, informal part of the evening very soon, but there is one more question over, over here. And I should add, just as... Um, as Jess is walking over, that there's also a resource list available um, as you go to have a look at the material if you want to follow up things, and it's, it's listing some of the um, books and original material um, as well. I'm very interested you're, 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 as you're moving from surviving to becoming citizens of Australia, and I'm just wondering what were the elements in those journeys, and when, for instance, did you get the vote, and when did you start to have all the rights that white Australians would have had and how long has it taken you? I mean, clearly you're not quite there yet, but I mean, for instance, so when did, when did you oh. first get the vote? Uh, I'm just looking to thought. <laughs> Unofficially. Unofficially. In the 30s? In the 30s. Unofficially. Sorry about that, yeah. And I suppose to, to answer your question, um, federal recognition only happened in 1994. So that we were actually recognised as a cultural group. So if you think that's only, it's not even 20 years ago, um, up until that day, I mean, you know, what were we? <laughs> you know, we, I mean, we knew who we were, but there was nothing for us to identify with officially. But presumably then, people who weren't deported had citizenship, though. Yes, we had citizenship, uh, but um, we were nothing. You know, we weren't, we weren't Indigenous, although some families have mar intermarried with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, but, you know, we, we went from Vanuatu, so we weren't Pacific Islanders in that sense. So... It was, we were just in limbo, you know, about our identity. So the 1994 um, recognition was monumental because we had that building block then to build on and then to, uh, for people then to fight for recognition and to get that from the state government in 2000. Um, that was a monumental occasion. And we, we did an interview with a gentleman by the name of Rex Egelmes, um, and you can see that down in the show downstairs. And I particularly, because I feel like sometimes we as a community don't take time to actually think about what recognition means to us. And I asked Rex, what does recognition mean to you? And he took a moment and he... Uh, you know, and a tear came to his eye and he said, my mother and father never, ever got to see this day. And I think that's probably um, one of the saddest things about our history at times is that 
people never saw the day that we were actually recognised as our own unique cultural group because we don't... My father tells a story, uh, and I had this experience with him when I went to Benawatu, where I returned to um, where we were staying one day, and he was having a conversation with some of the locals um, in language, and I thought, oh, okay. And I said to him, hang on a minute. Um, <laughs> we need to have a talk. And, <laughs> and he said, you know, and I said, how come you couldn't understand what they're saying and I can't? And he said to me, well, the old people used to speak to him in language, but they always had to reply in English. He goes, so I can hear it, but I can't speak it. And so that's why he never taught us, because the old people felt we had no need to learn the language anymore and that this was now our home and we needed to learn to live here. So on that rather, rather poignant, and thank you for sharing such a personal story with us, um, could we please thank Imelda and John? Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and please do come and have a look at the material in the, um, from the John Oxley collection as well, and, and we'll c continue the conversation informally. But just before you do that, <laughs> my name's Olivia Robinson. I work in Queensland Memory here, just at the back there, behind the John Oxley Library. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to thank you all for coming this evening. I wanted to say how great it is to have John and Imelda and, of course, Kate here um, uh, this evening. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with Imelda and John again over the last few months, bringing the exhibition um, into the State Library, but also all the many activities that have happened um, and continue to happen um, over this year. I also wanted to take the opportunity to give a very big thank you to Kate Evans. Um, <laughs> Kate is um, leaving us this evening as host of A Night in the Jail Well and um, we're really sad <laughs> to see you go. Um, Kate's moved to Sydney, um, which is... Um, uh, which has meant that, um, you know, all of the great time that you've been spending with us and as a fantastic advocate for the collection, as a fantastic advocate for the John Oxley Library and Queensland history, we're very disappointed to see you go. Um, <laughs> But, um, yeah, we're, we're so thankful for the effort that you've put in um, in all the time that you've been with us over the last few years. Um, just wanted to also remind everyone that next month, um, September the 18th, um, is uh, another A Night in the Jail Well, and that will be talking all about um, a distributed collection of Queensland memory, and we'll have some guests here talking about the historical collections that are throughout the state. Um, and our host um, for that, A Night in the Jail Well, um, will be Phil Brown. So um, thanks very much and please enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>